So, uh, dear friends, welcome. Thank you for joining us on this Saturday afternoon. Yes, welcome. Uh, if I can ask everyone to mute themselves so that uh, we can go ahead and get started. So, welcome to the. This is a uh, talk today on Ethiopia, Eritrea, from ancient civilizations to the modern society. It's a presentation by Alex or Alexander Teki, and we welcome him. Um, just to let you know about this program, it is sponsored by the Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Loudoun County, and it is organized by the Northern Virginia Baha'i Center Events Task Force. We used to have these events uh, at the Northern Virginia Baha'i Center, uh, but for now, uh, we are having it on Zoom. Uh, so the disadvantages that we don't get to see each other up front, but the advantages that we have beautiful people uh, from all over, including Kent Island and, and other places. So welcome. Uh, this is a series of presentations uh, that we have been doing uh, to, which is our cultural heritage series. Uh, it is kind of a, a, it's exploring the different cultures and immigrants that have come to America and they brought the promise of e pluribus unum, which is out of many one. And today um, we're going to go ahead and start with a prayer. And then after that, we're going to introduce our dear speaker. So if you would allow me to go ahead and uh, share my screen and uh, start with our devotion. So today, uh, we are very happy to welcome Mr. Alex Teki. Uh, Alex is not only today's speaker, but he's a dear friend and a colleague. Uh, I met personally Alex in the mid 90s when uh, we were youth and we would have these wonderful meetings and uh, Baha'i meetings and the, uh, the young professional gatherings that we had. So it's been a pleasure knowing him all these times. Uh, so Alex was born in Asmara, Eritrea, and he grew up in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. So he's very uh, a good candidate to speak uh, about both of these countries today for us. Um, Alex, after serving at the Baha'i World Center in Haifa, Israel, he made his way to the University of Michigan to complete his undergraduate and master's degree in urban and regional planning. He has worked in developing large-scale subdivision developments, transportation planning, and environmental impact reviews with various engineering and consulting firms in the area. He now lives in Glen Burnie, Maryland with his dear wife and teenage son, and he works in the area of sales and operations at Allied International Corporation. 
He also enjoys playing the guitar and has performed with musical groups in Africa and in the United States. And he has a great interest in reading history books and, and studying ancient civilizations. So without further ado, we're going to uh, give the floor to Alex. And I believe he's going to share his screen. And he has a very special talk for us. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Is the screen up? Okay. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Everybody can hear me? Okay. Yes, we yes. can hear you. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, for the wonderful introduction. Yeah, I would also say the same thing. Uh, Paul knows me better than anybody. <laughs> We've known each other for quite some time. And I'm very delighted also to have Dora from Kent Island uh with us uh very appreciative um uh, today what i'm going to talk about is the ethiopia and eritrea as the title says from ancient civilization to modern society most mostly most of you probably know about ethiopia and eritrea from what you see in the tvs the famine the starvation the civil war but there's another side to that countries, those both countries, there's a rich uh, historical uh, side to it. So I'm gonna present as much as I can uh, with a very limited time that we have um, the, uh, the presentation. So as you can see, the, what, what do you guys see on the first page that you see on the uh, PowerPoint, you see this uh, waterfall or, uh, do you know what that is? Anyone, if you know? Okay, that's the beginning of the Blue Nile. Blue Nile starts right there. We don't call it Blue Nile in Ethiopia, it's called Abai. And of course, Blue Nile cuts through where? Sudan and Egypt. There has been a very controversial issue to this day, is that right? Ethiopia wants to build a dump and they are having some issues with that. Now, so, so, so the outline of the topic would be, I will be talking about Ethiopia and Eritrea, the population, the language, economy, religion, historic sites, and the history of the Baha'i faith in, in Ethiopia in general. So Ethiopia right now, I left Ethiopia in 1986. The population at that time was about 80 million. So you can see the population growth <laughs> is tremendous. So right now, as of July the 21st, the Ethiopian population 118,727,305. That's roughly an estimated. And so Ethiopia is very ethnically very diverse. Um, the majority, the largest tribal or tribal group is the Oromo mostly located in central and southwest of Ethiopia. And the next one is the Amhara, 27%, as you can see. You will also have Somali. Somalis are also dwellers on the southern part of Ethiopia on both sides, on Somali land and on Ethiopian land. Uh, and then of course you have the Afar on the uh, east, northeast of Ethiopia, really bordering Eritrea. Uh, the Norman people, and uh, there are so many other things. So there are about 36 languages in Ethiopia. I was telling Paul during my preparation for this presentation, if him and I go to Southern Ethiopia, I would not, we would be in the same uh, position. I would not speak their language. They would not speak my language. So we have to find a common language. Usually what it is, English, is that right? <laughs> so. Uh, it's very diverse, very rich uh, language. And this is not a language adapted by Europeans. It's a language that's been written for thousands of years. Its derivative is uh, actually uh, from Hebrew and Aramea, the language of what Jesus Christ spoke. Uh, so it's a very, very diverse uh, uh, culture. So the diversity of Ethiopia, you can see it in the faces. Uh, most of the women that you see there are a combination of Muslims, Jewish, 
uh, Christians, uh, central part of Africa. On the bottom, you see the beautiful lady with the baby, which is uh, on the border of uh, southern Sudan and Ethiopia. And you see the priest and then the central part of Ethiopia, which is the known tribe called the um, um, see here, uh, the Kaffa region, the Walaita, and, and the beautiful lady with the green dress that you see as part of diversity. So Ethiopians, since Ethiopia and Eritrea are located on, on the long uh, stretch of the Red Sea, so historically it's known for the people diversity from centuries before the beginning of time. It was a gateway, so Turks, the Romans, the uh, Persians, the uh, Yemen, the Saudi Arabians, from all the way from India, people do trading. So you can see where the mixture happened. So, um, so very diverse. So here is the representation, nationality ethnic map. You can see it. All these are the languages that are spoken in Ethiopia. Uh, the one language that I speak, or two of them, are Am Amharinya, Amara, and Tigrinya, which is uh, next to Somalia on your uh, right-hand side. So those, those are the two languages that I speak. In fact, my Tigrinya is not as good as my Amharinya because I grew up in Ethiopia. Uh, ethnically, I'm an Eritrean origin. Uh, so my parents and our language is called Tigrinya, which is widely spoken in Eritrea and Tigray, which is the one that you see the yellow uh, map, really, uh, or the yellow section of the map on the northern part of Ethiopia. Ethiopian economy is mostly based on agricultural, and predominantly coffee is the largest production and export uh, source of income. And nowadays, Ethiopia has really shifted its economy from, from what's called agricultural to service economy. A lot of uh, industries, particularly the Ethiopian Airlines, is known for its service all over the world. Um, so, and an industry composes really about 21, 22% of it. And like I said earlier, coffee started in Ethiopia. The word coffee is actually came from a place called Kaffa. The place where coffee grew is Kaffa. It was a mispronunciation of the Europeans to call it coffee. So uh, coffee is the largest export in Ethiopia. Religious diversity is mostly Ethiopia's uh, uh, largest population is a Christian, as you can see the Orthodox. Uh, Muslims are about 31, 30, 34, 35%. And uh, the traditional beliefs and Roman uh, Catholic belief also is uh, known in that area. Now, talk about history. So Christianity is not founded uh, by um, missionaries in the recent years uh, that you see in Africa. Christianity has been in Ethiopia 700 years before Europeans discovered Christianity. So it's been a, a, a long history of um, Christianity's presence in Ethiopia. And of course, that stretches, we'll talk about that. The, the picture that you see is a cross structured uh, temple. Uh, they wouldn't even call it church, really. It's, uh, it's curved out of a big rock. Uh, as you can see on, the, on your right hand side, it's sort of below the ground. It's a monastery really for priests and monks. And uh, it's curved literally out of a big rock, so they curve it. And this is uh, probably in the 17th century. And nearby is uh, in, in Gondor, which is very close to the Lalibala. By the way, this, uh, let's go back to that. This place is called Lalibala. It was named after a king uh, that ruled Ethiopia in the 17th century. His name was King Lalibala. And 
in my talk, I, I'll try to address as much as I can the different empires, but Ethiopia was ruled by several kings and rulers throughout history. So as a story says in the Bible that Queen of Sheba traveled to Israel to visit or she, because she heard the greatness of Solomon. So she visited Israel and while she was staying, um, of course her main interest was to see the greatness of Solomon because he was known for his being a great leader. And uh, so in those days, remember when you travel, uh, you know, this is before the birth of Christ, all right? So you gotta go on the boat, on the camels, on the ships, on the caravans following you. And it takes month and month up to a year to even reach uh, cross, cross the Red Sea to Israel. So upon her arrival, of course, she was very impressed by his uh, uh, justful mind. He was very um, fair, keen, and she was very impressed. Uh, to make a long story short, upon her return uh, to Aksum, which is the, uh, the region that was very known for its trade, uh, she uh, gave birth to the son of Solomon named Melalik who became sort of the origin of the Solomonic uh, dynasty. So the story goes that uh, Melalik, after he grew up, he went to visit his father's place. And upon his return from historians, took the Ark of the Covenant. So when he took the Ark of Covenant and brought it here to Ethiopia, the, the monastery that you see on the left is where the original Ark of the Covenant is placed and nobody is allowed to get in there's this fenced. The closest you can get is to where those monks and priests standing as you can see. So, and also, um, you know, uh, during, now I'm jumping into uh, Islam. Islam has its presence from the time of Muhammad. As you know that the, when the, the Muslims were persecuted, Muhammad designated uh, uh, a group of Muslims to sink, seek sanctuary in Ethiopia. And he told them there's a king, a fair king in Ethiopia will accept you because nobody would take them. So that's how Christianity was spread to Ethiopia. And if uh, his history says that the first prayer that was recited was by an Ethiopian, the, the, the famous prayer that you hear, Allah uh, Akbar. So the, the presence of Islam also was widely spread. Uh, and also, to just to mention, I'm going the next one, I think it will show, I'll show you some, some of the uh, uh, historic sites. This is a uh, picture that you see the castle is the, uh, uh, the King Fasil's uh, fortress, that's what it means, Fasil Gibi. There's a fortress located in Gondar, uh, the Amhara region, founded in the 17th century by Emperor, uh, Emperor Fasil. Um, it's very unique, it's one of the historic sites. I think it's registered as a historic site uh, uh, in the world, it was along with Lalibela, the cross-structured, uh, cross-shaped structure uh, monastery. Um, and also the, there was, I think, a picture before that, the, 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 um, the mosque that you see um, is a kingdom of Jima. It's also part of central part of Ethiopia where the largest tribal lives, the Oromo tribe. And uh, they, a French explorer found the original prayers of Islam, you know, in that church in 1880. And we have talked about the Fasil Gim. So now let's talk about uh, when, whenever they think of Africa as mostly uh, a male dominated uh, kingdom. And, but history proved us wrong, correct? Queen of Sheba was a very uh, famous uh, queen. 
uh, conquered really what the beginning of Aksumite civilization. She is the one who was responsible single-handedly to uh, bring trades and commerce to Ethiopia. And uh, on the side story, there was also another one, uh, a Jewish background uh, named Yodit, or they call her in Ethiopia, Gudit, uh, established uh, her church and she was part of the, the 10th century queen. And um, literally because of her Jewish background, she was not accepted. So in um, resistance to that, she went and burned a lot of Christian church. <laughs> and so in Ethiopia history, she's known uh, as uh, Judith, or they call her Gudit, or someone that causes trouble or burn. Uh, we can talk this extensively some other time, just to mention this. Uh, uh, that's sort of, in a nutshell, the history of Ethiopia, the, you know, ancient history of Ethiopia. Now we'll go to Eritrea. Eritrea is about of the size of Florida, situated north of Ethiopia, literally the coast of the Red Sea. The entire Red Sea is uh, uh, to the uh, south north of Ethiopia, uh, Eritrea. Uh, there are also islands that you see, I don't know if you can see it, it says the Dahalak uh, Islands. There are several islands uh, in Eritrea also as part of the territory. In Eritrea, there are nine tribes, and I'm not gonna uh, harass you about memorizing this, but the most predominantly, the largest tribe is the Tigrinya, which is, you see it in the orange color, uh, mostly in Asmara, Masawa, Adulis, and these are the cities, uh, very ancient cities. So religion affiliation, of course, in, in Eritrea is different because it's 50-50 split, there are 50 Muslim, 50 Christian. And there are a few that don't really adhere to any of the Muslim or Christian faith. Ethiopia, Eritrea's population is very small, about three million, three and a half million. And Eritrean economy is mostly based on mining, gold, copper. Uh, that's really the source of their income. Um, the ancient history of uh, Eritrea as pre-Aksumite civilization, they found the ruins of the uh, settlement in a place called Quahito. It's very, very difficult to pronounce, Quahito. It's an ancient city uh, located in the southern region of uh, Eritrea. And it's uh, uh, very uh, economically known for its um, trading place. Uh, so gold, ivories, spices, as far as Rome, uh, India, Persia, this was a trading post uh, happened in this place. So Eritrean earlier history is uh, also really, when we talked about Eritrea and Ethiopia, is really at one time, it was a larger kingdom called the Aksumite kingdom. Um, you know, a very famous uh, Persian historian or prophet mentioned there were four kingdoms in, in the world known to mankind. Um, and you can, you can unmute yourself and if you know some of them you can mention, uh, it's allowed. But the four kingdoms are of course, the Persian, the Roman, Aksumite kingdom, and the Chinese kingdom, those are four, four kingdoms. So, um, so the Aksumite civilization really conquered a large part of Ethiopia and Eritrea along the Yemen uh, on the Western part, uh, all the way to parts of the Arabian land. Uh, So Eritrean history continues, arrival of the Italians, uh, of course, uh, sort of they sneaked in, as they would say, in 1869 up to 1885, moved to the port of Masawa and Asib in the Red Sea. 
of course, their motive was ulterior motives, uh, right? To settle, uh, they bought a piece of land uh, as a shipyard to uh, invest money for business. It was a private enterprise. But of course, the, mind, uh, the uh, motive was to easily penetrate to Eritrea and then, of course, try to conquer Ethiopia. So Eritrea became the Italian colony in 1897, as in, and uh, settlement of Italians mostly happened at that time in Masawa and Asmara. Masawa is a port city by the Red Sea, uh, of course, a famous trading post. Uh, so as they settled further in, inland, uh, King Mililik, who is the son of the descended son of King Solomon, uh, was very unhappy. So he knew that uh, this penetration is going to go further south into Ethiopia. So he wasn't really happy. So as the Italians moved to sort of Tigray to a place uh, uh, south of Eritrea, um, Mililik led about 70,000 soldiers. Mind you, this is uh, when the Italians send their soldiers, they said, ah, you can conquer this country with 20,000 soldiers, that's enough. You can easily conquer it and get it over. Mind you, this is also very a known practice, uh, what most textbooks will tell you as a scramble for Africa. Every uh, European nations conquered Africa, the, the French northern part of Africa, even the smallest country in Europe, Belgium, conquered a bigger, much bigger country than it itself in Congo. So the scramble for Africa happened very widely. So the only country that was never colonized was Ethiopia. So because of uh, Mililik, who defeated um, the Italians, and he really tricked them and cornered them into a, a, a a valley from uh, in Adwa, the place called Adwa, uh, and where they could not escape anywhere. So he rounded up his 70,000 soldiers, really uh, caused humiliation to the Italians to the point of that they said, we can't win this war and went back to Italy, well back to Eritrea because Eritrea was their colony. So Eritrea, the Italian presence in Eritrea is uh, fascinating. Is that similar to that of uh, the apartheid in South Africa? As you can see during that time, remember Italy was going through several expansion. Rome was overpopulated. So they needed a place where they can create what they call it uh, similar to Roma, uh, create a city where they can uh, live comfortably and with their ambition plan, they sent the, their best architects to build uh, famous building structures, as you can see in the picture. Uh, very, some of them were futuristic architectural design, some more traditional. Uh, the one picture that you see says Fiat, and is, is in, in Italian, it's called Talero. G is uh, sort of silent. Fiat Talero is a gas station built by an Italian architect. And the wing, it looks like an airplane, correct? So the wings were stretching without any support. And I wanted to mention the side story, an architect that built it, some of the uh, structural engineers told him that, listen, this building is not gonna stand and it's gonna collapse without any support. As you can see, it stretches out without no support at all. So he said he climbed on the roof of the wing at the edge of the wing and he said if it falls i'll shoot myself here and he had a gun and it never did so the structure stayed until today this is a recent picture of after the renovation that was done in asmara of course all these buildings were built to for the enjoyment of the italians uh, very futuristic architecture this one looks like a train uh, remember when the space architects were given the chance, it's like, a, a, what is it called, a, an experimental um, uh, ground for 
striving architects to build whatever they want to. There was no any limitation to what they explored. So you see classical architecture, futuristic architecture, and even on the pictures that you see, the opera house uh, still to this day in, intact. Um, uh, and then the building on the top is used to be World Bank, but it was also sort of a residential area to one of the richest uh, Italians. Uh, but at the same time, I wanted to mention that so the indigenous Eritreans were pushed into the outskirt of Asmara and they said, hey, we'll build you houses, no problem. So what you see is a bunch of huts clustered together for the natives so that they could not even go to the city. You have to have a pass, similar to that of apartheid. So this, the, the picture you see is a little village. Uh, it doesn't exist now, of course, but uh, it's totally different. This is how the situation was for the indigenous Eritreans. Uh, of course, you know, after the Italian settlement, uh, this is we going forward. Um, the British stepped in in the 1940s to um, uh, sort of intervene to remove Italians from uh, the Ethiopian colonies. Of course, you know, you remember the 1930s. 33 to be exact, that uh, Italians actually managed to penetrate all the way to Ethiopia. Uh, they stayed there for five years. Uh, during that time, Haile Selassie, who was the king of Ethiopia, was in exile uh, and went to London uh, and with the support of uh, the British, he gathered his troops in five years and went back for the Italians. And of course the Italians retrieved, but with the help of the British, but the intention was to sort of British slowly to move in into uh, particularly Eritrea. That was, it was a strategic location for import, export, and trade. So um, this agitation started at that time that uh, Eritrea was always part of the Italian colony. So they were trying to find out to, you know, how could we handle this? So um, the, uh, I'm gonna skip this. I don't wanna dwell too much on it, but um, you know, as, a, as this agitation continued, Haile Selassie shamelessly interfered to secure him uh, with the union in, in Eritrea. And he successfully uh, abandoned Islamic practice and uh, he enforced uh, Amharinya, which is the main language in Ethiopia to be taught in school systems, and, and gave Eritrea what's called an Eritrean administration, sort of uh, autonomous power, but it wasn't part of Ethiopia. Then, of course, the ambition went further um, with the help of the United States in the 1950s, uh, 45, uh, Haile Selassie managed to annex Eritrea as part of Ethiopia. So how am I doing on time, uh, Paul? Is it good? Okay. Uh, so now, uh, if you have any, uh, we'll talk about the history of the Baha'i faith in Ethiopia. Of course, the first Baha'i that brought the Baha'i faith to Ethiopia was an Egyptian named Sabri Elias in the 1933, 17 years old. And uh, he was uh, initially, uh, uh, imagine, mind you, in the 1933s, uh, <laughs> it's sometimes very, uh, it just amazed me how people traveled. Uh, there was no airplane, so you have to take, you know, ships, trains, horseback, and so forth to get to your destination. And it, oftentimes it, it would take you a month, two, three months to get to your destination. So he landed in, in Addis Ababa, not knowing the language, not knowing anybody at the age of 70. Uh, he learned the trade of uh, 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 sewing clothes. So he opened a tailor shop in the middle uh, of Addis Ababa. And he started teaching the faith. And uh, lo and behold, 
he uh, managed to find some interesting people by the Baha'i faith, and he taught them the faith. So, and in fact, he managed even to translate Baha'u'llah and the New Era from Arabic to Amharic in one year, single-handedly. So he was a, a very prominent, uh, and of course he later on got the title of the land of Baha'u'llah. So the first local speech assembly was established in 1934 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And um, a picture uh, speaks thousands of worlds. Sabri Elias is, uh, I don't know if my appearance is showing, is right here. And I don't even know some of these people, uh, but uh, the one in the middle that you see is a lawyer uh, named Gila Mikhail Bahata, known to most Ethiopian Eritreans as the first Baha'i. But there was also another Baha'i that less known about him. His name was, uh, his last name was Seal. I have to get that fact, uh, but also went from Ethiopia to Eritrea, pioneered, established the first local speech assemblies in 1955. And of course, it's unfair for me just to mention this too, alone, but the Baha'i, uh, the pioneers that, that came to Ethiopia in the early 50s and late, late, late 40s and early 50s, uh, wanted to mention one of them, whose family lives in Northern Virginia, Dr. Faroman, who was a dentist, um, you know, went to Ethiopia, lived there with the entire family for many, many years. Uh, it was, I wish, uh, um, his son would participate in this Zoom, but uh, unfortunately, I don't see his name. But uh, uh, Fouad uh, would, uh, would, uh, told me a story one time that the Shah of Iran went to visit Haile Selassie in the, in the early 1950s, or I would say late 50s. And uh, he's, he had a, a tooth acting problem and he was in pain. So Haile Selassie managed to find a Persian dentist. And that dentist was Dr. Faroman, who treated the Shah of Iran. And the Shah of Iran was surprised to see a Persian in Ethiopia. He said, what are you doing here? Oh, he said, I'm a Baha'i. Oh my God, you Baha'is are everywhere. And the Shah of Iran was very surprised. Later on, as history tells us that, you know, Dr. Faroman, even I think treated the royal family, so it was, uh, it was his service uh, as a dentist. And of course, there was also in the north, Dr. Ahge, Dr. Rushdi. These are prominent Baha'is, gave up their highly uh, paid uh, profession in Iran, pioneered to Ethiopia, and some of them later moved to Somalia, Djibouti, and so, uh, Sudan, settled in this place all their lives. So the great tribute, just another Zoom class will not suffice to be honest, to talk about this great giants. Um, so um, I remember one story vividly when we celebrated the 50th years of uh, the Baha'i faith in Ethiopia. I was only, I think eight or nine years old. I was a child. And so Sabri Elias was invited then he was living in Djibouti as a pioneer. Never went back to Egypt. Remember Egypt at that time, it became Islamic state. The Baha'i faith was abolished. And so he has no place to go. So he settled in Djibouti. But when he celebrated the 50th years of the Baha'i faith in Ethiopia, he came to Ethiopia with his wife and his family. And when he saw a gathering of thousands of people that came to hear him, he was completely shocked and very emotional. He could not even finish his speech. And I think he said, the only words that he said I remember was, thank you, Baha'u'llah. And he went back to, to his seat. So this is in a nutshell, uh, I hope um, I, I got you the glimpse of the history and the uh, general information of the uh, Ethiopian Eritrean history along with the Baha'i faith. 
Uh, if you have any questions uh, at this moment, we can discuss it, open it, and uh, talk about it. You can ask me any questions. If I have the answers, I will answer. <laughs> Thank you very much, dear Alex, for such a wonderful presentation. We're now going to open the floor. And as uh, dear Shazin uh, has done, we can raise our hands or just uh, you can unmute yourself and um, ask a question. Uh, if you prefer also, you can put a question in the chat um, for us to answer it. Uh, if you also like to remain Anonymous, you can send the chat directly to me and I'll be happy to share it. So we're going to go first to dear Shazin and then to uh, dear Marissa. Uh, Shazin, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you very much uh, for the beautiful presentation. I have two questions, but I asked only one because I don't want to waste the time and give time to the other people to ask a question. The question I have is the, what is the relationship between the Eritreans and Ethiopians politically, economically, and socially? Very good question. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I just kind of uh, gonna go back to uh, the 1940s. Um, major historical events, uh, basically Eritrea was, uh, never part of Ethiopia to start with. It was uh, by itself uh, uh, a separate entity. Uh, but because of its strategic location, uh, it was uh, an interest to many, many countries and nations around the world. Be because that's the only gateway to Eastern part of Africa, really uh, from centuries, by the way, it's not just in recent histories, from uh, the Aksumite civilization um, trades traveled all the way to the central part of Africa to uh, buy and trade ivory that at that time was uh, considered the gold uh, to spices all the way to India, the Rome, the Turks uh, over time even ruled Eritrea. So it's, it's really um, um, difficult to, uh, to say when that started. But that we know from history that uh, Eritrea was a, a separate uh, country. But remember also when the Italians invaded Eritrea, they were there longer in the 1800s, um, uh, but they were not part of, uh, they were separate countries during that time as well. So the, most of the separation or the, uh, I wouldn't say the separation, but the conflict started uh, in the 19, in the mid forties, 45, when the British actually helped Haile Selassie to push the Italians out of uh, uh, the Tigray and that region, Ethiopia. So they didn't know what to do with Eritrea because the Italians also eventually left. They knew that the British uh, would come and attack them. So at that time, uh, many countries, of course, even the US uh, was interested to uh, decide the fate of Eritrea. So with these nations being involved, they were giving the upper hand to, to Haile Selassie to sort of annex Eritrea as part of Ethiopia. The struggle started then, the conflict started then because Eritreans claimed that they, first of all, they were not involved. Nobody consulted them. This is our land, this is our territory and nobody should decide what what you know we, we should do with our country. So the struggle started uh, in that region. Of course, the US you know, naval uh, settlement happened in Masawa. So the US was interested also um, to really give Haile Selassie the upper hand to annex Eritrea as part of Ethiopia. So during that time in the late 50s, the sort of the armed struggle for independence of Eritrea started. Of course, Eritrea became an independent. Uh, I didn't go into that detail. In 1993, after one of the longest brutal war that took place in the history of Africa, between, uh, that is between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Does that answer your question? 
Uh, yes, but uh, specifically now in 21st century, uh, do they have political relationship? Do they have economical relationship? And personally, socially, what is their relationship right now in 21st century? Thank Very you. Good question. Very good question. The 21st century, of course, after long, remember in the 1990s uh, when the uh, uh, Mengistu Alamariam, who was uh, backed by the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, uh, lost his power. Uh, the, the 1993, the, the Tigrayan uh, or the Ethiopian that liberated uh, or ousted uh, Mengistu Alamariam created a good relationship with Eritrea because they were forces fighting that regime uh, together. So the, the relationship right now is very actually good. You know, it was landlocked for a very long time, for almost 20 years. Now, in recent years, the two governments agreed to open their borders, trade, and they have a very good relationship right now. Uh, particularly, Ethiopia played a big role in opening that avenue uh, because the young leader was very uh, open to say, listen, this uh, landlock for 20 years. Uh, is not benefiting any one of us. We have to find a common solution. We have to recognize uh, Eritrean's independence and we should move on, And which is a good approach. And now really culturally, there's no difference between Ethiopia and Eritrea. They both eat the same food. They have both Christians, Muslims, language similarity, particularly with the Tigrayan, south of Eritrea, north of Ethiopia. They share the same language. And, um, uh, and also uh, culturally, they're from dance to music to food, they all share the same thing. So it's, uh, it's amicable relationship right now. But you know, like anywhere else in Africa, tribalism and, uh, and uh, um, regional conflict is a nonstop thing. And still Ethiopia suffers right now from tribal conflict. The largest tribal Oromo demands that we should be the ruling party. And Amhara says you're not. And this in recent years has caused so much conflict, bloodshed in Ethiopia. So it's slowly, uh, it's improving right now. Uh, but it's an ongoing problem in, in Ethiopia and Eritrea. But between the two governments, I think there's an amicable relationship uh, now. Does that answer your question, sir? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Uh, I believe Marissa has a question. Please go ahead. Kindly yes, unmute yourself have... first. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alex, thank you for the enlightening uh, presentation. And I would also like to acknowledge my good friend, Turkan Nabi. I haven't seen her for a long time, maybe more than 20 years, but I'm glad to know that, you know, she's here today with us. My question is about the Baha'i faith in um, Ethiopia and Eritrea. What is the status of the Baha'i faith now? in both those countries? Very good question. Uh, in Ethiopia, the Baha'i faith is very, very, doing very well. Um, and the, the amazing things are happening. The teachings are everywhere. The Ruhi classes, uh, uh, the government is very friendly towards the Baha'is and a lot of proclamations. Um, so you can freely yeah, on the other side, in Eritrea, it's kind of uh, uh, Baha'is do not have uh, full rights, so to speak. They can practice, but they can't really gather more than nine people at a time. Uh, is that also applies not only to the Baha'is, but to other religious groups like the Pentecostal, the Jehovah Witnesses. And because the, the government has this, um, um, uh, for lack of a better word, sort of... Uh, this uh, Western brought or imported religion, they would assume sort of contaminate society. 
So it's more restrictive in Eritrea than in Ethiopia. So Ethiopia by far is really a fantastic uh, place to visit, even from pioneers from Ethiopia travel other places in Africa. Um, it's a very vibrant community. Um, they have programs uh, on TV, some Baha'i initiative programs uh, for children's uh, classes everywhere in every part of Ethiopia. And it's, it's an amazing thing that's happening. You can Google that and YouTube, you can see some of the programs that are happening there. Thank you, Alex. Um, I had a question also. If you go back to your slide uh, of the churches and the uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant, <clears throat> I actually did not know what that meant, um, what the Ark of the Covenant was. And when I read it, it's my understanding, is it a, it's supposedly a box that is in gold and it contains the, the original 10 commandments that was right. given? If you want to explain to that, maybe that would be very nice. Yeah, you know, it's, it's really, to be honest with you, uh, really nobody knows what's in there. Uh, it's been sort of a hidden subject. Uh, no one has actually seen it. But history tells us that when King Melilik, which is the son of Queen of Sheba, that became the king of Ethiopia, his King Melilik II, his son, went back to Israel to see his father's birthplace. And he actually established a church in Jerusalem. On his way back from Israel, from what some historians would say, he stole the Ark of the Covenant and took it to Ethiopia. And it traveled from many places. So to this day, no one has been actually inside that, that, uh, that uh, monastery that you see there. Zion uh, Monastery. So that's one part of history. Of course, history is always who tells the history, correct? His story. So, and uh, Solomon, who heard about this, kept it quiet. He hashed it. He didn't want anybody to know about it for it until the day he died. He told his, his generals and his ministers, do not even mention it was stolen. So that gave them um, a leeway to even take it further into deep, deep parts of Ethiopia to central part of Ethiopia, which, which what you see is there. So they know if they kept it in the Northern part of Ethiopia, you know, the routes are easy, they can come and investigate and confiscate it back. So uh, that's what, what historians claim that what happened. Thank you for that explanation. It's very fascinating. Um, any other questions or comments that we would like to hear? Uh, go ahead, Shazin, please. Uh, because we have time, I ask my second question. Uh, Alex, please uh, uh, tell us that I have read that the Emperor Selassie was considered uh, a, uh, a living divine, similar to Hirohito. Mm -hmm. If this is so, how did the people of different religions in Ethiopia and Eritrea, or one of them, uh, as Muslims and Christians, cope with the living divine? That's a very good question. Actually, I was telling Paul earlier that uh, Haile Selassie, uh, even among the Rastafarians, is that right? His name is actually uh, his real name is Ras Teferi. Ras means head. Teferi is his title, which is head of Teferi. So Haile Selassie was given to him because he was also considered a priest. So in, as in history in Ethiopia, most of the kings that rule, they were also a divine leaders, so to speak. So they kind of... Uh, uh, take that title. So Haile Selassie, by most Ethiopians during his, um, his time, was considered a spiritual person. And by the way, just to be fair, he did so many things to the development of Ethiopia. He introduced uh, 
modernizations of the infrastructure, the highways, the system, the train, the airplanes. He's done so many good things here to Ethiopia. Um, and also that, for instance, have you heard the Rastafarian movement or the Jamaicans that believe in Haile Selassie as a return of Christ? Uh, the history goes like this: uh, in the 19, uh, early 1960s, there was a very successive uh, uh, drought in Jamaica. Almost for 10 years, there was no rain. The last king to visit uh, Jamaica was Haile Selassie, and when he arrived at the airport, uh, it stopped pouring. Rain was raining and didn't stop for 10 days. And some believe that as he was waving his hand uh, when he uh, arrived at the airport, some believe that they saw the nail mark and believe that he was the return of Christ. <laughs> so uh, today, even historically, Jamaicans uh, believe that uh, Ethiopia is their holy place. And they have actually a settlement in, um, um, and Shashamene, uh, sort of uh, a city, a place uh, about 300 kilometers south of Addis Ababa, um, where they, he gave them a land. And some of them are farmers and live, they've been living there since then. So, uh, but most Ethiopians, some of the, uh, his followers believe still he's a spiritual leader, but uh, not nowadays, you know, they don't really see him. Of course, you know, he was ousted in 1974 by uh, a, a communist regime. Uh, but, uh, you know, I believe even some of his gr uh, grandchildren live in Virginia still to this day. Um, some family members still live there. But he's, he's really sort of a, a historical figure than a spiritual leader. That answers, uh, Sharif? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. I wanted to, since there are no other questions, I uh, wanted to ask about um, Haji Mubarak, who was um, uh, an Ethiopian um, um, of descent of Ethiopian descent who used to work in the household of the Bob. Correct. And um, if you want to mention something of my understanding, he was very well educated and the Bob entrusted him in business and um, he helped the Bob uh, in, in, in his business dealings and collecting money and things of that sort. If you like to mention anything about that, if you're aware of. Yeah, I think you, you say it well, you know, there's really nothing to add. Uh, not, by the way, uh, in most, uh, you know, religious figures, you know, uh, go back in history. Um, the first Muslim that recited the uh, Allah Akbar prayer was an, an Ethiopian. Uh, oh, I forgot his name. It Is to it Belal? Belal, Belal, Belal. Belal was the first Ethiopian to say the... Muslim prayer. Remember also when the uh, so Muslims were persecuted, the only king that received, the only Christian king that gave them a sanctuary was a king in Ethiopia. And so the relationship between the Muslims and Christian in Ethiopia is really uh, fair to say very amicable. There's no conflict that you see. Uh, but the same thing, the same token, the three wise men that visited the birth of Christ, one of them was an Ethiopian. So it's, it's historically, they have this really linked to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and of course the Baha'i faith, as Paul say, the very uh, uh, devoted servant of the Bab was an Ethiopian. Thank you very much. Marissa, I think you have a question as well. You're on mute, sorry. I like, I like a lot of questions, if I have the answers for them. <laughs> From what I know of Ethiopian and Eritrean civilizations and from your presentation, um, 
it seems that, you know, the civilization of Ethiopia and Eritrea goes way back during biblical times. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah, this is, in fact, uh, I, I used to do a presentation on music because uh, music is uh, one of the things that you find uh, that it travels with time, correct? Especially in musical instruments. Uh, so, uh, you know, before Europeans start writing musical notation, the first musical notation was found in Ethiopia. Uh, this is 700 years before Europeans even discovered Christianity. Uh, king Yared was one of the kings who was also a priest, uh, used to write musical notations. To this day, in some of the monasteries, they have that, uh, that uh, musical notations that the priests read with melody, so similar to chanting, like in Persian or in Arabic. Uh, so uh, the language itself is one of the oldest languages, correct, for Aramea. Then you have the Aramea, the language that Jesus Christ spoke. Then you have, of course, Hebrew. And they believe that Ge'ez came out of Hebrew. And in modern day, Tigrinya is also a derivative of um, Ge'ez. So it's, um, it's a very ancient history. It's, uh, in fact, uh, archaeologists believe that the first a uh, human being was found, a skeleton in Ethiopia. Now they found another one in Eritrea. So it's, uh, as they call it, the cradle of civilization for many, many centuries. What I just gave you is just a little bit pizza of pieces because of time. Right. Uh, we can take one topic and discuss it forever. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a very, very, uh, I would recommend, there's a book that I would recommend if you're interested to read. There's a book called Layers of Time by Paul Haynes, who's really an expert. Uh, I consider him um, a very, uh, first of all, he's a non-biased because history always is written in a biased format. But uh, Paul Haynes, uh, who lived in Ethiopia for many, many years, he's an American, just recently passed away, wrote a book called Layers of Time. It's really went into a detail. He spent years and years gathering information, the different dynasties, the different rulers, the kings. You know, there were over 180 kings in Ethiopia, in that region, that ruled that region. Very regions, the various regions that I showed you on the map, they had their own kingdoms. Uh, the Aksumites have their own kingdom. The Gondor has a fossil king. So there were many other kingdoms that, uh, that you can explore some other time, or you can explore it on your own. Uh, you know, if you're interested. But it is, yeah, so one of the ancient civilizations. In fact, the Guardian was very delighted when he heard that uh, the first translation of the Baha'u'llah and Nehra into Amharic was translated. He was very elated that the fact that the Baha'i phase was translated into one of the oldest language in history. So, and he even mentioned that uh, uh, Sabri Elias was really who conquered Ethiopia spiritually, not Mussolini. <laughs> so as far back as um, the time or the period of King Solomon, Queen Sheba was the one who was the titled ruler of Ethiopia, right? Yeah. Well, so, Ethiopia, you I, Ethiopia, I, Ethiopia and Eritrea at that time, that region was called the Aksumite so, uh, kingdom. It stretches back all the way to Yemen. Uh, it even goes to part of Sudan, uh, part of part of Saudi Arabia. So it's kind of uh, you, you can't really pinpoint and say Ethiopia. Of course, Ethiopia is on the center of that region, and Aksum, the region that you saw where trade happens, the trading post, was heavily used by the Romans, the Turks, the Egyptians. Uh, Indians, the Persians, for, for trades and commerce. So that's why you see the diversity of people also. If you look at Ethiopia, the people that settled or lived in the Red Sea and Eritrea, part of Tigray up to Shoa, they're very mixed, is that right? So you see people that looks like Arabic, you see people that looks like uh, uh, Indians, the people that looks like, in fact, I, I had so much to show, but, you know, time was uh, uh, 
uh, we didn't have time. There are some blue eye uh, Oroman people that would uh, freak you out if you see them. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very diverse society. In fact, it's believed to be like a, co a combination of 700 nations. Uh, so it's, it's very diverse. That's why the, uh, even, you don't have to go that far in my family. If you see my older brother, he looks like more of like an Arab than an Ethiopian. Uh, uh, my sisters look very different. So it's, uh, it's, it's very, you can see it in the, uh, in the people's faces. I'm sure in Northern Virginia and Washington DC, you probably run into Ethiopians uh, and they all look different. You know, uh, central part of Ethiopia is really sort of indigenous, the Kunama tribes, for instance, in Eritrea. They were untouched for many, they didn't have any connection with the outside world. So they remained uh, uh, indigenous Africans with darker complexion. Uh, so it's a uh, it's very diverse uh, society, the same thing in Ethiopia. Uh, in fact, I don't know if I could, uh, if you uh, go back in the pictures that I showed, you see, uh, this, this tells you, you know, some of them look, uh, you know, people from the Middle East, uh, some look uh, very, uh, Arabian looking and some indigenous people. So it's, it's a very, very diverse uh, uh, culture. You know, musically the same thing. You can see people uh, playing music in the Northern part versus the central part and Southern part, totally different with different instruments, you know. I agree. Um, what I'm trying to get at is as far back as, you know, the biblical times, the Ethiopians recognize women and their ability to rule oh, yeah. because, you know, the example is the Queen of Sheba. Um, she was the one who ruled, you know, that region at that time. Yeah, um, coming back to, you know, modern times, what is the status of women in Ethiopia? Well, you know, as time progresses, of course, the status of women diminished along with the changing of the empires. But in fact, women at one time dominated uh, Ethiopia, not only Queen of Sheba, Yodit, the lady I was telling you, the Jewish uh, Ethiopian lady that ruled, in fact, actually destroyed the Aksumite civilization single-handedly. And there was, uh, there was another one called, in fact, before Haile Selassie for a short time, she ruled Ethiopia. Um, I forgot the name, it will come to me. So, in, in, in the previous centuries. In fact, King Solomon himself, if you read in the Bible, was scared of Queen of Sheba because he thought that she was coming to invade him. So, um, and he, you know, did not trust her. In fact, it says in, in history that he went to her bed uh, and sort of gave her a pill to sleep uh, more so that she doesn't wake up with evil thoughts to conquer him. So, but uh, of course, the historic goes that she, he, you know, he uh, impregnated her, gave birth to Nililik, uh, uh, their son. But you're right. In 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 Ethiopia, for instance, the president of Ethiopia is a woman, even though that uh, woman, the the prime minister has the you know, the highest status. But now in Ethiopia, particularly, women's participation in government is almost their gov the government, from what I was told, is half women, half men. It's equally divided. So the uh, um, uh, access to women into education, uh, services is very widely uh, available in Ethiopia. In Eritrea, the same thing. Uh, Eritrea, in fact, during their struggle, uh, Eritrean women were the largest uh, military uh, force in Africa. And people don't know this. Uh, so during the liberation fight, uh, women fought side by side with men. It's not they were just, uh, you know, subservient. Uh, they played a big role and uh, even in government positions, but that's uh, a different situation with Eritrea. So that's a very secretive government 
and you don't know a whole lot about the government. Uh, so less to be said about that. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, unless anyone has any other questions or comments, um, uh, please speak up. Uh, otherwise, we're going to start wrapping up. Any other questions or comments? I know we're getting uh, some thank you notes in the chat and uh, everyone thanking uh, dear Alex for his wonderful presentation. Well, in that case, thank you very much for joining. We're going to again, thank Alex for doing such a wonderful job tonight and joining us. And uh, we will occasionally have these sessions and uh, next month, uh, I'm sorry, Dora, were you, did you want to mention something before I close? I see you unmuted yourself. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I just wanted to say thank you to Alex. Thank you. Hey, Faria, how are you? Thank you for, for uh, participating. I appreciate that. Thank you, thank dear you. Alex. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we are going to continue with our programs. I, I, you Please, if you haven't already signed on to the Nova BC Announce, uh, which is the Northern Virginia Baha'i Center email list. Uh, you know, you can message me. I'll be happy to put you in touch with the facility manager. And we can send all these uh, wonderful talks and sessions that we have. Uh, there are many great things happening always at the center. We also have the Sunday programs that I know some of you attend uh, Sunday mornings at 1030. Um, so it's wonderful to, to be able to get together on Zoom. Uh, we are going to go ahead and close with a prayer. I'm going to ask Alex if you can kindly stop sharing uh, your screen so that I can uh, put our closing prayer. On. And I, please note uh, that. Paul, yes. If you don't mind, can I share a prayer in Amharic? Absolutely. Uh, we'll do that. So and then uh, um, just a slight reminder that this uh, program will be. Uh, posted in the Northern Virginia Baha'i Center YouTube account. So if you would like to share it or, or see it again, uh, it will be uh, within a week or so it should be up there. So without further ado, we're going to close with a Amharic uh, prayer by Alex. Thank you, Alex. Go ahead, please. Okay, this prayer is a healing prayer uh, um, for people that are ill. Uh, some uh, quick recovery, and it's a healing prayer. I'm going to recite it. I'm like a hoy, summum of a wishing. Young Tim Tizita, Madame Tim. Would Aunt Timacrab and then Tim. Aunt Tadliff, Garbalda Ravan. Young Tim's a garbazin or Navazan Yalam, Marija and Nama for wishing. Bona two for Suntarit, Ulunim the Tauk. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending. It was wonderful to be with you and thank you again, Alex. Can I ask what language that was in? Absolutely, absolutely. That language was in Amharic, uh, which okay. is a part of Africa, uh, Ethiopia. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Bye bye. Good night. Bye bye. Nice thank you very much, everybody. All the best. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.